there was a protocol to be followed, strictly followed, and that was that both the penitent who um, um, may have been solicited was required to keep it secret, and everybody that knows of it in the clerical culture was required by that protocol to keep it secret so that Rome could deal with it. Correct? Honestly, I've not studied the document for many, many years, so I can't offer you much reflection on it. The focus was so narrow, it's a kind of a matter that I never had to deal with. In your meetings with victims um, that, that you have had and dealing with this over the years, you have learned about the harm caused by childhood sexual abuse by priests. Yes. And you know it's grave. Yes. And it, you know that it was described by Stephen Rossetti, a priest, as, uh, as, as deep spiritual damage, which he calls the slain of the soul. Steve, Steve is a friend of mine. I, I did not remember that he used that phrase, but I have heard the phrase, and I know Steve Rossetti. I think he wrote the book by that title, didn't he? That could well be. In any case, um, were you aware that in 1985, the Catholic Conference of Bishops met in, in St. John's uh, and received uh, uh, a report on what to do uh, concerning the crisis of pedophilia in, uh, and molestation in the priesthood by Tom Doyle, um, Ray Mouton, and Ray Peterson, the then director of St. Luke's? Was that, was Ray his name, the third fellow? I think there might have been just a little different. It was Ray Mouton and Ray Peterson. It was both Ray, okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, I've learned through <coughs> media reports, that's why I was in, I was in oh, graduate school. Oh, Michael Peterson. My, there we go, Michael. Okay. I thought so. Yeah. I don't know that I ever met Michael. He died just about the time I was returning from Rome. Did you learn I, that a report had been made to the Catholic Conference about the gravity of the problem in 85 in any case? I did, yes. I learned through the media report. Did you become aware on your return from Rome that anything was being done responsive to that report at all? Yes. What was being done responsive to that report? Yeah. You probably don't want a long answer, but I'll give you some, give me a some minutes. All right. Archbishop Roach was the chair of the, the administration, the, he was president of the United States Catholic Conference. A lot of this happened precisely because of him. Part, where did that come from? Bishop Carlson was pricking his conscience because of the horrors of this fellow Adamson to say our church has to respond very differently. Bishop Carlson, uh, supervised me very briefly in the summer of 1984 and before I was going off to graduate school and one day brought me into his office and said I want I want you to pay attention because this is the most important issue you're going to have to deal with and that's when I met the parents of a sex abuse victim so the whole time I was away at school this archdiocese was really trying to turn up the heat on its understanding and its response of course, the biggest, uh, the two biggest things that happened, I, and I can claim no positive credit for these, there was a series of trainings mandated for all our clergy and, and all the other lay professional ministers invited to in the fall of 1987 and the spring of 1988 on sexual abuse of minors, sexual exploitation of adults, sexual harassment of coworkers, and then the January 1988 policy was printed. So that, I'll stop there. What have you learned uh, uh, in all of this about the impact of childhood sexual abuse uh, by clergy on the victims? I actually first became aware of some of these concerns before any of this. I had the privilege of taking a course at Luther Seminary in the spring of 1980, believe titled Ministry to Families in Difficulty, and learned then of the impact of child sexual abuse. And that shaped my ministry throughout my years of priesthood. Once I came to work at the Archdiocese, I learned of the additional pain caused by the betrayal of clergy trust. And what impacts um, uh, 
very briefly and how devastating do you understand that to have been and to be? Like, like other forms of trauma, it will have differing impacts on differing individuals. The impact is mitigated when the person who makes the complaint is treated with respect, supported, made counseling, uh, given availability of counseling immediately. But it can cause, uh, especially when it's surrounded by lots of falsehood, violence, intimidation, it can cause lifetime harm. You're aware that it's actually aggravated by reason of the, the extraordinary position of trust and reverence that the cleric enjoys over the faithful. I've taught that myself many times. And that in itself, that betrayal of trust is perhaps one of the most damaging components of clerical sexual abuse, that that's, power. That, that's certainly reported uh, uh, in terms of people's individual testimony. I don't know what the scientific reports are on it, but I wouldn't doubt that it's trim that the, the clergy and, and physicians and lawyers and others, but I'll stay with clergy, the clergy cause particular harm, yes. In the case of Father John Brown, did you learn that in the 1960s he was reported to then Archbishop Binns for examining the sexual organ of boys and um, uh, but after retirement, it became known that he lived at a scout camp. Did you know that? Yes, about that? and yes. Yes, I knew about the report, and yes, I knew about living at the scout camp. And uh, you noted in 1992 that um, uh, did you become concerned about that in 1992 and record that? I did, or even sometime in that period of time, yes, when we were doing. Uh, a, a routine re-examination of files. I think this. I think it was earlier than that because I believe Father O'Connell discovered it. But I'm there's, not certain. There's reflected in 1992 that you are, are concerned that he's doing religious services for scouts. Do you remember that? I don't recall that that's a year, but I do recall being concerned about it. Um, there is reflection in in 2001 that you again note that Brown is living on the grounds of the Boy Scout campground. Um, do you recall having done anything about what you learned earlier? Yeah, uh, I'm surprised that 2001 is still true because my, uh, my intervention in the early 90s was to say Brown ought to be moved away from the scout camp. I believe one of the bishops was assigned to do that. Okay. The I'm record reading. will show that. Okay. I was reading from the I know from the file. It, it reflects in March of 2002, Bill Fallon and you met with Brown and asked him to leave the Boy Scout camp. Do you recall that? I don't. Um, uh, Brown's name is on uh, the 2004 list of those deemed to have been credibly accused as assembled under the you know, charter. Uh, but that was not released until um, December of uh, 2013. Do you believe that his name and those other on that list should have been released to the public long before that? Do you know, you and I may disagree about release to the public. One of the places he was pastor was St. Peter Claver, where I took the matter to the parish many years ago. I took it to Boy Scouts leadership back in the early 90s. Uh, I don't, uh, I talked to some of the leadership at Waverly where he had been. That was sometime in the 90s. I'm focusing so, on the list though now. I released right, the list. So this, name and on I, that list. And don't you think that should have been released? Well, I don't agree that, I don't think lists are, are apt instruments. I'm sorry, I still don't today. I don't think the world's a better place because of that. But I do believe that disclosure has its very, very important utility, and I tried to engage in that in regard to John Brown. Well, isn't that, isn't, isn't that in itself a warning to folks that we have information that this person has been credibly accused? And doesn't that put them on notice of something they otherwise might not know? Right. I, I believe that reasonable people can disagree about the specific utility of lists. It's all rather a moot point now at this, 
new point at this time. Isn't well, it? warning of known dangers is not a moot pro problem. It is. We're here today because this case has made the claim and the court has found that we can discover the nature and scope of the problem as it exists past, both past and present. Yeah. So I believe I did disclose John Brown in places where there was likely to be, uh, where that information was likely to be helpful. Well, the, the presence of those that didn't, didn't hear that and weren't present was not known until December of 2013. If you, if you saw fit to make it known to a small group of people, why didn't the archdiocese see fit to make it known to all those that needed to know who didn't hear it from you? Object to the form, so I, can yeah, I, I will simply say the decisions I was recommending to the Archbishop in the 1990s were to disclose to people for whom the information would be a benefit. And I was not covering up the information throughout that time. Uh, at some point in time, David Pastusta uh, had a confrontation with Brown, and you were present, correct? Yes. And Pesusta asked Brown uh, what the archdiocese knew about Brown's history. And at that time, do you recall kind of stepping aside with Brown's niece and then coming back and ending the conversation and confrontation so that the answer could not be given by him? I wouldn't characterize the meeting that way. He did. How would who did? Who did? David Pesusta. David. He never got, he asked the question, you intervened with the niece, and never got the answer. Okay. That certainly was not my intention, and I doubt that that would be reported by David's therapist, who was also there. Yeah. That could be checked. Yeah. Um, Brown was put on the monitoring program, was he not? I believe that's true, yes. According to the monitor in 2006, he was, was still volunteering every week at the St. Boyksdale camp. Did you? I don't recall that. Well, that would have been one of the monitors under your um, supervision, correct? Right. Uh, my recollection is that what he was doing was winter maintenance at the Boy Scout camp. Not Boy Scout activities, including worship, but he oughtn't to have been there. Um, Father Joseph Weida is a priest that um, has publicly protested his innocence and, um, and claimed to have been falsely accused and um, um, made that quite public. Um, when did you first learn Weida had both been accused of having abused kids and did in fact abuse them? I learned that he'd been accused in probably in the late 80s or very early 90s. So it's nearly as long as I've been at the Archdiocese. Uh, for a long time, there were, he, he protested it was not true. He's always denied. Yes, he basically is always denied. But yes. you also knew that many kids came forward. Yes. Yeah. And you believed the kids. I believed the number of the kids, yes. And how many kids actually did report abuse that you did believe? I believed at least four of them. And there were Curiously, if I would just mention, subsequently after I'd kind of come to the conclusion that, that they were telling the truth, a family member came to me, family brother of, pardon me, a sister of one of the complainants who said that she understood that this young man and, and his friend had concocted the complaint. So I, I found, I thought the complaints were difficult to act on canonically, but I wanted to see him treated as restricted from ministry with minors through the 90s. There was actually a canonical proceeding that that made an instruction to remove him from the clerical state. Yes, yes. And you, um, as I presume the promoter of justice, overrode that instruction and instead of removing him, uh, recommended um, a 10-year suspension, no. correct? Uh, no, 
Would tell you me, like it? Yes, I'll give you an tell accurate. Tell me how I got that wrong then. Yeah. So I was the prosecutor in the case. One of the things the prosecutor does is recommend a sentence. The uh, sentence I recommend, and we're, uh, we're required to take into account in making the recommendation both mitigating and uh, exacerbating conditions. Whita complained that he had been abused by a priest when he was young. And recognizing that any finding for dismissal from the clerical state would be automatically appealed to Rome, I wanted to demonstrate that we were considering, that I was considering acting as the promoter of justice, uh, his uh, claim that he had been abused. So I asked for uh, that he be removed from the clerical state <coughs> for 15 years, hoping that in fact what would happen would happen, that the court would find no, we're going to impose the current sanction, which is lifetime removal. That's still under appeal, my understanding is in Rome, and I'm hopeful that whatever he's alleged about what ought to motivate his being uh, his sentence being mitigated will have already been obviated by my intervention. Did he, uh, Wada, allege abuse by one of the priests on the list? I believe so. Who? Uh, I don't recall who it is now. One of the fellows many, many years ago. And I've told. Let me come back to Wada, but um, before I do, uh, I want to go back to um, your own laptop um, and the one that you kept while Vicar General and as Delegate for Safe Environment and handling these, uh, these matters, um, doing an investigation, being the implementer and the like. Um, did you keep your own files on your laptop and notes that you prepared in connection with these matters? I, I think from time to time I borrowed an archdiocesan laptop but did not use a, did not have a laptop of my own. And so have you retained any of those notes, records, or files um, in your own possession? No. And who has possession of those then? Uh, most of whatever material I had, I turned back to the archdiocese, and and uh, whatever else, you know, the, the laptop should be with the archdiocese. The I have uh, given all of my personal records uh, to my attorney for review. And um, what personal records are you talking about? During the period I was. Uh, no longer at the Archdiocese. I think I mentioned several hours ago that I would sometimes, when I asked to send a recommendation to Archbishop, particularly, I would keep a paper copy of that myself in case he would follow up with me. And those have all been turned over? Well, they were all delivered, of course, uh, because that's the nature of the things. They were, they were given, uh, they were sent to the Archbishop. It re is reflected in records that I've reviewed that when you take, when you made interviews both of priests and uh, victims, um, you would take notes, but you had the practice of destroying those notes. Is I that had correct? the I had the practice of turning them into a memorandum and then destroying the notes. And how Not always, of course. At times, I simply sent the raw notes to the file. My preference was, however, to convert them into. Uh, a memorandum to give a full understand, full uh, reflection of my understanding. Why not uh, retain the notes and prepare the memorandum so that you, there can be a full and and complete recitation of what you heard and or re, uh, and record, recorded. Right. My responsibility was to report to the archbishop and the other 
uh, leadership of the archdiocese. So what I tried to do was prepare uh, a, uh, a record that was useful to them. And that I would do, by the way, uh, contemporaneously within that day or a few, several days. In connection with Wada, um, there's uh, an indication that you met with him uh, on October 4th of 1988 and that you're typing, typing a summary and destroying uh, notes. Is that the, the practice we're referring to here? That, you know, I, I'd like to see, 1988 is a long time ago, I'd like to see the document if, if I could. Exhibit 170. I'll see if we can pull it out and I'll show it to you. Um, do you recall when you started the canon process against Wojta? That would have been 88? about no, the, about the canonical process, the, meaning the process for dismissal would have been about 2009 or 10. Do you recall receiving information that Wojta uh, was warned that the statements he had made um, and um, the Archdiocese made a finding that he could be charged with a crime or the crimes of obscenity, obscenity and solicitation? Obscenity and solicitation, I think, was part of what I put into the my brief as the my brief as the uh, promoter of justice. I'm going to show you Exhibit 174. Get this out of the way. Are we going to be going to this book? Can I put it aside for now? You may bring this back. Uh, yeah, I put it aside. And um, I'm going to put before you 174. And you'll see that this is a document. Um, at the top, it says obtained by NPR News. And I presume that would have been the first time it was made public, as far as we know. Is that correct, as far as you know? That's correct, yeah. Where was this kept? Uh, probably in the vault file. I don't know. I wasn't the archivist at the time, or the chancellor. Is that the archival file, also known as a secret file? <laughs> no, certainly not a secret file, since there were no secret files. Probably in, in uh, the Archbishop's correspondence file and in the whatever working files the other people on the Archbishop's council had. I... Um, and um, At the second page, you identify the partial list of the parishes that merit special attention and the priests with known abuse histories. Why is that a partial list? Uh, notice it says partial list of parishes that merit special attention. So I think, I don't know why I, this isn't about the priests, but it's about the list of parishes. So I don't know why I characterize it as partial. And then um, at the third, you don't dispute that this was something prepared by you. That's correct. For the not. eyes of the Archbishop um, and the Archbishop's Council only, correct? Well, for the eyes of the Archbishop and the Archbishop's Council. Only? I wouldn't say only. The, they might choose to share it as they, I, don't, I didn't restrict it, but that's for whom I prepared it.
And where did you get the information and these names listed? I believe largely from my memory, uh, perhaps also from looking at the file drawer. And which file drawer are you referring to? The one in Judy Delaney's office we've talked about. Is that sometimes. in the Hayden Center or, or in the Chancery? No, that was in the Chancery. There's also a file drawer in the Hayden Center where files are maintained, is there not? I don't know that. Pertain to this topic of sexual abuse. And I priests. don't know that. Is this file drawer the only drawer where um, uh, uh, files pertaining to sexual abuse are maintained? To your knowledge? This course, now we're, my knowledge doesn't extend beyond mid-June of 2008. So you're asking in the present tense. You said that you referred to the Archbishop's correspondence or the Archbishop's file. What are you, what are you talking about there? Does the Archbishop maintain a separate and discrete file? Well, again, I don't know what's been going on since 2008. What do you know about the Archbishop maintaining his own files concerning priests abusing and his file retention? I really knew nothing throughout the period. I'd be very surprised if the Archbishop had kept separate files, but he might have on his desktop, uh, you know, the top of physical top of his desk, the current working files he had. 